Once upon a time, there were two little girls named Deb. One little girl grew up to be a preacher, while the other grew up to be a pagan, and they both grew up to be the very best of friends. Join the preacher and the pagan as they take a fresh look at Christianity from the inside out and the outside in. <laughs> Recordings in progress. So, are we ready to do this? <laughs> We're going to be ready to do this. Hello there. Hi, Deb. Good morning. How are you doing, Deb? I'm doing great. It's three thirty in the morning on my end of the picture here. Yeah, um, and 5.30 for me, and to be fair, for those wondering what the heck we're doing up at this hour, I'm going to be camping all day with a couple of hundred five- to eight-year-olds, so we had to squeeze this in while I still was able to do something. Oh, my God. Isn't it like 400 degrees below zero over there? No, we haven't hit winter yet. We're into pretend fall at this stage in the game but the weather is agreeing we just got the tail end of a hurricane last night so at least the rain happened yesterday and not today so well it's all good it's just oh nice my god early campsite. yay for you uh, yep so, so this, this week we're going to talk about one of our favorite uh favorite genres do a little little something a little different than we have done in the past it's actually so cool because you and I are big giant nerds and not just theology nerds, but we are Star Trek nerds and mm-hmm. Star Trek has a very complicated history with religion and faith. Um, one of the things I find so funny about it is both people of faith and atheists want to claim Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, as their own. You know, atheists are like, he is a wholehearted atheist. And people of faith are just like, ah, he's got religion all through there. Oh, yeah. yeah. And and it really is. I mean, there you are able to find some seminary in the English-speaking world at any time in history that teaches a theology and Star Trek course. Mm -hmm. I have known of seven of them, at least in Canada, even though I haven't participated, I know about them. Yes. And it's true. And, you know, I, I, I fall into the gene was very spiritual and had a very firm faith grounded in humanism. I don't fall into the atheist. I I don't fall into the atheist camp for Gene simply because he's got it woven in through so much of the everything that he was involved in. Um, what I always found about Star Trek, at least through Gene's vision as I saw it, was he never had any problem with faith or spirituality or even God. What he had the problem with was a controlling authoritarian god that only led by you know crushing the will of the followers yeah and you see it time and time again in the original series the robot god you know demanding absolute slavery mental and physical slavery of its followers Mm -hmm. and since he was raised strict southern baptist I can see why he'd have an issue with that. Well, exactly. And that's that's one of the, uh, uh, I think, the ironic things of Star Trek is that Gene Roddenberry, in his vision, he dealt with, he understood, he, he, he sensed, if not um, was overtly conscious of, the real conversations of theology, which are um, diversity, which are... Um, helping others which are uh good versus evil like the, the real big things this this control superficial thing that is not actually religion that is power wearing religion as a wolf in sheepskin and um i think he got that grasp even if he couldn't articulate it i mean he might have i don't know but um i, I think a lot of people today don't necessarily realize that for truly faithful, educated people, 
that version of control is an anathema. It, it's not an accepted part of the tradition, but that's what people outside of faith, that's all they seem to see. Yes. So I think that's why we can have groups of people kind of claiming, and I'm going to put that in quotes, um, uh, that Star Trek is representative of them. I mean, in my definition of humanism is basically theology with no ritual. Um, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I don't. I don't think it does. It doesn't exist pre theology being being voiced. Well, um, in in good theology, good faith, whether it's Christian or whether it's a pagan path that I follow, is almost identical to what Jean would have called humanism, striving mm-hmm. to be the best you can striving to create right. a paradise on earth where people's needs are met where their their am, their ambitions and their goodness as human beings are realized and you know where we're treating each other with respect and dignity and not exploiting the land or other resources once you take away the descriptive language if you just look at the reality of what gene wanted and what most true followers of Christianity and, you know, what Jesus said and what the, the and Harmi Nun, the pagans say, it, it's identical. It's the same mm-hmm. thing. It's just, yep. you're not like ceding your responsibility to some invisible guy in space. You can use the universe or Star Trek as your inspiration, or you can use your relationship with your deity as inspiration. But in the end, true faith means you have to be active. You have to be part of the solution. Yeah. And we see that in a lot of the, um, uh, the religions that are represented, if not positively at least not negatively they're kind of in that gray area uh i mean the bajoran tradition is very very strong in um in deep space nine uh wharf's klingon tradition is very much a part of his character um representation the Um, bajorans actually the bajoran faith actually i find fascinating because it is pretty much a representative of everything a faith can be Mm-hmm. You've got, it's it's got a complete and utter spectrum, whereas you have it's it's the 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 the, the rope that a desperate people held on to in times of oppression, which is where Christianity got its mm-hmm. start, and it goes all the way through Kai Win, who abused the power yes. and who completely misinterpreted. Because I think Kai Wen's faith was very strong. I think it was just twisted. Yeah. I yeah. think she completely misinterpreted what the the faith should be. And you see that over and over and over in all religions. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's a great teaching tool yeah. as to how faith can be used for good and how it can be twisted for purposes that absolutely harm people. Yeah. And in the creation of these traditions also... They're not simple. And that's one of the things I really respect about, about the off-world religions that Star Trek brings us, is they're not easy answer faiths. Mm-hmm. And earthly faiths are not easy answer either. The way they're tr- treated as such is a problem. Yes. Um, and I, and I, I do have an issue with how um, uh Earth faiths, and particularly Christian, because we're United States is is nominally Christian um, mm-hmm. for the majority, uh, and the Western world that's the tradition that we know the best. So when uh, when religion is dismissed as being flighty or superficial or or whatever, I think that does a real disservice to um, the human condition. There there is a, a discovery. Um, not last season, but the season before, season two, I think. No, season three. Um, had a I had a scene where um, uh, oh shoot, name escapes me. Anyway, I was talking to the uh, the head of Star of of Starfleet. Um, uh, Starfleet, thank you, and um, was still repeating the myth of the thousand years of darkness. 
and surreal. That was it. And it just, it was cringy um, that they're still holding on to some of the misrepresentations of, uh, of earth culture, especially Western uh, Christian culture. And yet they're so open and, and accepting of the religious traditions off world that have been created um, by then. It's a, it's an interesting juxtaposition that, that I watch frequently. Well, you know, you're you're talking about writers who are writing in an external world, but who are living in the present world. Well, exactly. And just because they can see outside a potential for something doesn't mean they don't have a blind spot in their own reality. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but that's an, that's an example of how Star Trek might be futuristic, but it's also very rooted in the now yes. um, and, and how uh, difficult it is. You know, something I I've, have done with Star Trek myself is I've used it as teaching tools. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember when I was in, uh, in seminary, um, that was right around the time when uh, TNG and Deep Space Nine was coming out. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, the opening show of the second season of TNG. I think it was called The Child. I, I didn't yes, look it up. The I'm child. Sure. Um, but it, it that is straight up incarnation, the story of Jesus. And I remember um, I had to do a, a seminar in um, a seminar class in uh, um, in one of my courses. And the professor was kind of like, um, uh, sci-fi and I said just trust me so I played the episode and the whole time the professor was in the back going wow oh yeah right yeah wow and it was oh. it was she was almost more entertaining than the show at that point in time because I'd seen it so often um you you but the fact that me. it was ab it, it was the story straight up like there was there was no distinction and I mean oh. I will continue to to go back to that one my only complaint about the show is that Beverly Crusher wasn't there but outside of that I oh, uh, we're I was, not gonna go yeah. into that war honey yeah no I'm no I know that but last. you know gotta gotta put up my crusher love um, in in my perfect world, Catherine Pulaski and Bev Crusher are BFFs off screen. They go out and they party. They get they get drunk on Cardassian suicides and they prank call the the Enterprise and make okay. fun of Jean Luc. They have wild no, girls. I, that's my reality. I I there's not going to be any hate between the Trek doctors. Okay. All the doctors are <laughs> I didn't loved. say there was. There was just. I'm just <laughs> saying my preference for that episode. It's the only thing, but otherwise, it's it was stellar. Um, but it was an, it was a great example, I think, of people uh, of writers representing a story theologically without trying to represent a story theologically. Yeah. Um, and it it's just it, it stands out. I mean, and I've I've seen it all. I mean, I haven't seen um, the original series uh, it, um, as often as the others, but um, it's pretty. There's a, it's there's pretty a, cringy um, watching ri- original series uh, right now. Honestly, yeah, some of them are really yeah. difficult to watch. But well, exactly. But, and I was never a Shatner fan. Um, there there is a. a, a the book we were both reading, The Gospel According to Jean Roddenberry, um, they really do a long uh, thing on an episode called Return of the Archons, mm-hmm. which is the one with Landrew, you know, festival, festival. Uh, do you, I don't know if you remember that episode. No, but I don't. But Landrew is the, the ultimate computer god. Mm. Do you watch... You I, you say you watched uh, Discovery. Did you also watch Lower Decks? I saw most of season one. I honestly oh. admit the cartoon track doesn't work for me. I respect that it exists, but it doesn't quite work for me the same as live action does. The the reason I love it so much. Okay. The, okay, the reason I love it so much is it is such a love letter to the geeks. Mm. There are so many Easter eggs yes, in there. Yes. And in context of what we're talking about, Landry, the end of that episode, the the return of the Archons, they've pretty much broken the grip of 
the 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 computer god mm-hmm. right and free the 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 the, the followers right so lower decks the entire point of that ship in lower deck they do second contact mm. right they follow up on the missions you know the big guys do the first contact well they follow up and do all the paperwork and make sure all the communication satellites are set up and all this crap right well in one of the episodes of Lower Deck, they go back to Omicron 3, which is the planet of the return of the Archons. And the first thing they notice is, wait, what? It's only been 100 years. They're back to, wait, they're worshiping the Landru god again? They have gone right back to where we left them? And it's like, I was thinking about that the whole time I was reading the book about the gospel, uh, according to Roddenberry, it's such a temptation. You break out of that, I'm going to let somebody else be my spiritual authority. You break out of that prison and you think for yourself, but the, the ability and the potential to slip back into it is so easy. And mm-hmm. I love that they actually address that, that if you are not diligent, if you are not willing to put in the work, eventually you are just going to go right back to letting somebody else determine your destiny, somebody else to determine your spirituality. And Mm -hmm. I love that they followed up with that. It was one, and Landry shows up every so often and they have like this whole room of captured computer gods. I mean, it's like this entire wall of cubby holes with little computer gods fighting for supremacy in this prison <laughs> and it's freaking hilarious it's such a trope in star trek that they've just riffed on it and it's hilarious mm, we'll have to look for that but, yeah i do find uh i do find star trek is able to um to really grab the irony i mean i realize lower decks is, is played for laughs um but Star Trek as a whole is uh, is really good at revisiting a lot of the uh, like they don't leave things hanging they kind of come back again and again and again mind you sixty years of of television allows them a lot of room to do that well and it's it's good because you have to you can't just it's not a one and done thing faith no. is not a one and done thing people think you find your faith you're quote born again. And you never have to do any more work. That's not how it works. Well, no, it that's ha- why those of us thing. in the business talk about it as a practice. Mm-hmm. It's something you have to you keep working on again and again and again. And I think the reason why um, Star Trek keeps revisiting a lot of the same topics and a lot of the same um, architecture around religion is that ultimately what they're trying to dig down into is um, the biggest questions in human society. Like, why am I here? What do I contribute? Why do I exist? Um, Is there good and evil, Uh, love and hate? Um, uh, The big stuff that has, has been the central point of all theology. And I do want to draw the distinction. There are religious traditions that are not theological traditions. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, throughout our history, but those who've actually spent time around the proverbial um, pub table with the, with a brew have been wrestling with this issue, and I think that the parallel of that with Star Trek experiences um, is, is kind of what keeps a lot of their their perspective, whether it's done through humor or done through through uh, through drama, so um, so fresh. Because they're not letting go of those essential questions. And, and that's the thing. Those are the questions since the dawn of, of, of human cognition. Mm-hmm. That faith, art, all the important things, philosophy, all of these, these, um, all of these, um, studies or I can't think of the word of course it's killing me Mm. but they are all looking for the answers to the same questions who are we what are we why are we here what is our purpose Mm -hmm. 
And we are all looking for the same answers. We're just using different methodologies well, that's, to do and, it. And that essentially and, is the historic definition of religious discourse is uh, um, trying to answer some of these questions. And the fact that Star Trek never does give pat answers. Um, if, that's helpful. Even in, even in the, the shows that are episodic, that they wrap everything up in a nice bow at the end of the, of the show, um, the bigger questions are never wrapped up. Those kind of continue on. And one of the things that Star Trek constantly comes back to, I can think of several episodes um, in in pretty much every single one is the question of faith and the 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 difference between tr- a questioning faith and a blind faith mm-hmm. because so many times especially in these first contact thing, situations they did a lot of it during next gen but uh they also did it in voyager as well as classic trek where they're making first contact and there are people who are ready to embrace this new this new understanding that really challenges their their concept of life and then there are other people who really struggle with any idea of change from the orthodoxy any change mm-hmm. from how it's always been and it really almost breaks them and yes. Star Trek revisits that over and over and over again between this, the type of person who I would say is, 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 is mentally or emotionally conservative, almost to the point of reactionary as to the other people who are willing to at least expand their mind. And the ones that tend to fare better are the ones who are open to learning new experiences and expanding on what they've already had, which mm-hmm. is pretty much the definition of the the theology you and I are talking about pretty much every month when we come here. This Absolutely. idea of being able yep. to see beyond what orthodoxy shows you and try to understand that in a deeper, more profound level that takes into consideration all the new information we are constantly getting, evolving. Absolutely, but that's, that's, the, that's the, the places they visit. We can't say the same thing again about the crews. They are so convinced that they are right in all situations that it's very rarely that the Star Trek crews are challenged enough to think about something. Thing. Which is why I wanted you to watch the episode from Voyager called Sacred Ga- Ground, mm-hmm. which is one of my favorite episodes of all time. Did you watch it? I did. I did. So you tell me why you love it so yes. much. Because, you, okay, quick premise. Kess trips, falls into some sacred temple and is like, boom, she's in a coma. She's going to die. Well, because of their faith, they can't do anything. Kess is as good as dead. Well, Janeway finds a loophole. If she goes through this trial, this struggle, this whatever, then she can possibly talk to the spiritual elders and find a way to gain Kess's life. So as she's going through this ritual, there's this group of old people that are just sitting there and she's like, why don't you sit and chat? No, 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 no. I have to do what mm-hmm. I have to do. I have to take care Very of Very action focused. She goes through these gruesome, gruesome challenges, Jane Way. And at the end, she realizes the three people she'd been ignoring the whole time were the elders that she needed to talk to. And all of this trauma she put herself through was of her own making that it wasn't she didn't have to struggle she had to accept and it there's this conversation they have is oh you like your facts and figures you like to have all of your ducks in a row and you need to know why and everything has to be so so pat for you you just don't stop and accept 
and accept mm-hmm. that there may be something outside of what you can quantify. And mm-hmm. in the end, she ha- takes a leap of faith and she brings Kess back into the same field that caused her coma and it cures her. And the, the whole payoff for that entire entire episode for me is the very last scene where Kess is there with the EMH and they're trying to figure out why it worked. And the doctor, Catherine's sitting there quietly and the doctor is going on on all these all of these scientific reasons why it would have worked and all these hypotheses and she's just sitting there quietly half listening and you're you realize it's occurring to her that all of this all of this control she's trying to put over it all of this gut-wrenching faith in science that, you know, we know everything. We know that there's always a scientific reason. Maybe we're wrong. And mm-hmm. it's just that moment where her faith in science in is tested. And, I mean, she mm-hmm. still believes it. In, in a practical level, there is always the fact that this is what keeps them literally alive in space. Science is keeping them alive. But there's this crack in the armor where she opens up to something, there might be something more. And Mm -hmm. it's like this life-changing experience for her. I don't think that that character was ever quite the same after that experience. And I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and it's it's the truth. You can't, you can't live your life completely assured of everything because you'll never grow that way. Yeah. But it, but the temptation does really speak to human nature. I think that's why we, we, I've read so many memes where religion is the destruction of the world. It's like, no, no, no. Power is the assumption that you can have everything, know everything, be everything. That is a problem. Religion is just, along for the ride it's yeah. it's the costume it's not the uh, uh the actual issue the stagnation yeah. yeah yeah i but that no that is one of my favorite episodes for exactly what you said they they're so sure that they're absolutely right yeah all the time anytime i see one of the characters or one of them especially one of the captains get their faith shaken and tested their faith in Starfleet, that, because Starfleet is their God. Yes. Let's face yeah, it. Absolutely. And they're, in, in the true fundamentalist way, they don't entertain any other possibilities. They are completely convinced that they have all the answers and that anybody who has any level of intelligence will join them. And you know what I find it's so wonderful and interesting about the later generations of track, the later iterations of the show, is how many purists, how many old fans hate the new shows because it's not Star Trek. Mm -hmm. What it does, a lot of these new shows are literally doing exactly that. Challenging Mm -hmm. is Starfleet exactly. Is the Federation the only good way? Is it just we're right and everyone else needs to join us or wrong? And he's pushing those limits and it is challenging it. And it is forcing the entire series to evolve. And there are people in fandom who absolutely hate it. They hate it. Mm -hmm. They say it's disrespectful and it's wrong and it's killing Star Trek. But no, I think it's just evolving it and bringing it in a very exciting direction i am so excited for the shows that are coming out yep. right now well, and, and are... star trek is, as much as it's futuristic is still very much in our time yeah. i mean what we got away with in the 90s with the uh, tng ds9 and voyager those shows couldn't be done today no so i'm like, like the truly original truly series offensive. could not be done yeah yeah but um, th- and that's the thing as the as Western culture has to evolve, so the show is evolving with it. It yep. is a product of its time. 
just as Jean uh, fought the, the 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 Vietnam War and civil mm-hmm. rights, you know. Oh my God! There's non there's non binary people in Star Trek. They're so woke. Oh, shut the hell up! There are non binary people everywhere. You just yep. didn't want to yep. see them. Well, guess what? Star Trek is yep. acknowledging yep. them because they are there. And yeah, yeah, you know, this uh, absolutely. A small example of how this show has evolved with the times. I think Gene would be extraordinarily proud of the new shows uh, that his act- his son is actually a- executive producers on these shows. So mm-hmm. I think he would be extraordinarily proud of the direction the shows come. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think so as well. Um, it, it's asking questions and it's looking at situations that we either weren't aware of to ask 20 and 30 years ago um, or too scared to. And I think that's, I I think at the heart of Star Trek, whether you're um, coming at it from a religious perspective or, or a non-religious perspective is that like, like faith, like history, like anything, it should leave you disquieted. It should not give you a sense that, Everything is known. And yes. that is whether you're a, a, a religious fundamentalist or a Star Trek fundamentalist. Um, that discomfort is actually a good thing. It forces yes. us to see, um, to see the world in slightly different lens. Uh, and ultimately, really, that's what Star Trek was about. It wasn't just repeating um, society at the time back. I mean, there's some of that, obviously, but um, but that it's leaving, it's setting the groundwork for questions like, should I really be this adamant about this particular position? Should I really think I have that much power? I'm just thinking of, of Picard, where he was trying to say Romulans and the Federation pulled the plug and he is now seen as the mm. bad guy. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's not been a Star Trek captain ever seen as the bad guy by a canonical species. I mean, the, the occasional species of the week, maybe, but a, a canonical species generally um, mm does not go from antagonism to enjoyment back to antagonism um, the way the Romulans have with Picard specifically. Um, And when he walks in and he cannot grasp that they won't see him as their savior. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't do, I mean, the show's only 10 episodes and that's not the focus of it, but he never actually does the work of figuring out why. Have have you seen season two yet? Yes, yes, I have. I, um, yeah, I'm, I mean, and I'm that's the beauty of Q. Oh, we, my heavens, we haven't even talked about Q yet. The brilliance of Q, and from any any Christian biblical scholar's point of view, Q is hilarious because Q, uh, the symbol Q, is um, uh, comes from the German word Kel, I think, um, but it's source. And uh, the, the basic the theory of the Gospels is that there was, um, there was original writings from Mark, original writings from, from um, uh, John, and Matthew and Luke copied Mark, and this outside source that we identified as Q. So I got to tell you, having Q the whole time I was going through seminary was absolutely hilarious. But he is the one that continuously comes in and pushes Janeway and Picard particularly into really wondering, are you as important as you think you are? Are you as good? Are your decisions as important? And unfortunately he's painted as the villain, um, but he's He's so of a trickster. He really is. And he would be what, uh, uh, what Hebrew tradition identifies as, Ha Satan. Um, Satan is is um, is a mythical creature out of the Middle Ages, but Ha Satan, um, what is actually in the Bible means the challenger. Um, basically, picture a court of law, someone who's really putting it to um, uh, the primary defender. Uh, are you who you say you are? Have you done what you think you have done? But Q really fills that role, an yeah. absolute genius. I mean, the, the, the Q character kind of 
cuts through it all and says, you are not as impressive as you think you are. Mm-hmm. And because it's got this tinge of humor in it, it is a delicious character. You oh. want to have more of it. And that's, that's the thing. In the very, very best episodes of Trek throughout its history, it's left you questioning, am I really doing the right thing? I mean, think of City on the Edge of Forever. The only way, you know, he has a choice. He could save this wonderful woman and let Hitler take over Europe, or he could let her die a horrific death and save millions. There are no easy answers in life. There are no easy answers in Star Trek. And when it does its job well, like you said, it leaves you uncomfortable. It leaves you questioning so that you have to dig deeper into what your idea of right and wrong is, what you would be willing to sacrifice for the greater good. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I love this. we could talk for years on this. We could. We could. We and have. We've come right back to the, to the beginning, why people teach Star Trek and theology courses, because there is so much. But we've got to wrap it up, Hannah. i got a camping go to, to go to. You have fun. I'm going to stay in my nice uh, climate-controlled house and take a nap because <laughs> it's four in the morning. Mm-hmm. I'm Deb Bodwin. You are Deb Suttered. And yep. And this, the this was Creature and in the Pagan. Thank you so much. You guys have a great day and have a be safe out there. Live long and prosper, babe. Absolutely. You too, honey. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Preacher and the Pagan with Deborah Suttard and Deborah Bodwin. This podcast is a two-lady podcast production in conjunction with The Barefoot Evangelist. Our producer and sound editor is Catherine Gordon. Our theme music was composed by Deborah Bodwin. You can reach us at thepreacherandthepagan at gmail.com or by visiting our website at barefootevangelist.ca forward slash podcast.